Looks like the camera is rolling. Uh, remind me, I'm going to give you that in a bit. Not yet, though. Okay. Ready for your quiz? For your quiz? Sure. I got to tuck my shirt on so I look halfway civilized for the camera. <clears throat> Who do you guys think this is fun, though, all things considered? Is this homework? Yeah, it's the sermon, and then that's the um, Good. chapter sentences. Hide it for now. We'll get to it later. Just camera. I'm gonna smile for it. Good, you. Yeah. Apparently, people like these kind of side conversations. So. All right. Question number one. This quiz is over the first eight chapters. Well, no, it was actually we covered. Yeah, we covered the first eight, that's true. Well, I hope you do well. Question number one, true or false? 50-50 chance. Belshazzar was the first son of Nebuchadnezzar. True or false? Belshazzar was the first son of Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't look like you're cheating, but I can almost read the indents on that paper that have all the answers on it, so Good. watch yourself. Don't look at it. Yeah, they're there. Because of our... You know, part of me thinks it would actually really stink to have, like, perfect memory retention in some ways, because... It would. Because then you know all the answers, but would you really know them? Because they get clouded with everything else. Like if you have an amazing short-term memory, you'd pass school, and then you would all just like forget it or get mixed with everything else. Yeah, it sure does, <laughs> yeah, it does, to one degree or another. But that's why people who actually, it seems like people who don't retain as well or have to work harder to get it, keep it longer. You know. Seems well, then that poses the question, do people photograph memory really learn anything? Just... Oh, I'm sure they do. I'm just, I don't know. I just wonder. I don't know enough about them. Yeah, sure but enough. I do know people with bad memories stand a good chance. Because once you do know it, it's like it's there a lot of times. Mm. Question two. What key event in Nebuchadnezzar's life caused him to no longer send out military troops or brag about idols? What key event in Nebuchadnezzar's life caused him to no longer send out military troops or to brag about idols? I'm assuming spelling is not going to be a huge okay. No, don't worry about that. Just as long as I know what you're trying to write. Why are you trying to spell Nebuchadnezzar? Because I can help you with that. <laughs> no. I always remember Nebuchadnezzar because it's it's Nebu Chad. Like there's always a Chad in the middle of Nebuchadnezzar. N e b u Chad. N e z z a r. Chad the Czar. Nebu Chad Nezer. Chad Nezar. So question three. Looks like they're still writing. I'll hold off a little bit longer. You're so sweet. Okay, I'm done. Question Dang three. It. True or false? The gods praised in Belshazzar's feast were probably, and I emphasize that word probably, Marduk, Nebo, Nurgle, and Ishtar. True or false? The gods praised in Belshazzar's feast were probably Marduk, Nebo, Nurgle, and Ishtar. If you recall in Belshazzar's feast, they actually said, give praise to the gods of wood and stone yeah, and materials. And, and we talked about what that probably was talking about. <clears throat> hmm. 50 chance. Those are my favorite. Question four, true or false? The book of Daniel is written in chronological order. True or false, the book of Daniel is written in chronological order. 
That's almost a freebie right there, I feel like. Question five. How do you think I'm gonna feel now if I got it wrong? Yeah. You know, I feel weird sometimes saying question when I'm like, true or false? I guess I'm asking, is that true or false? But it's more of a, I read a statement. Anyway. Yeah. Question five. How many beasts were in Daniel's vision in chapter seven? How many beasts were in Daniel's vision in chapter seven? Six, number six. That's not the answer, it's just number six. Uh, Both the beasts in chapter seven and the statue in chapter two represent what? I don't need super specifics, I just want general answer to this question. Both the beasts in chapter seven and the statue in chapter two represent what? Number seven, what ancient symbol slash bodily appendage indicated both swiftness and power? What ancient symbol slash bodily appendage indicated both swiftness and power? I'll give you a little hint here. This is on one of the beasts. Okay, one of the beasts had this. And it symbolized swiftness as well as power. So think about those beasts. One of them swift. How did you know he was swift? Because he had this. Um, question eight. <clears throat> what ancient symbol slash bodily appendage indicated might and extreme strength? And again, this is on one of the beasts. This is eight. <laughs> this is question eight. Yeah, what ancient symbol slash bodily appendage indicated might and extreme strength? And one of the beasts also had this. I don't think these questions are that hard, so I hope you're not overthinking them. It's just... What represented this? The swiftness of power, what represented strength? Number nine, true or false? Some think Daniel's vision of the little horn refers to the papacy. The what? The papacy. You know what the papacy is? That does not sound familiar at all. It's from the word Papa. The Holy Roman Papa, also known as Pope. the Pope. Papacy. Oh, you know, yeah. The word Pope comes from the That's word right. for Papa. Yeah, Father. I know. Yeah, I remember. And Jesus that. said, call no one father because you only have one father in heaven. Yeah. But that's the Bible, and Catholics don't use that. Just yes, kidding. They do. Just kidding. They use a Bible. See, there's a Catholic comment in this. I have yet to see one. No, they use it. It's a nice decoration. Have you, have you seen one comment it's on beautiful. those YouTube videos? I love the pictures. Just kidding. I haven't seen one. Uh, comment. No, I haven't, and I moderate all those comments anyway, because when I say something hurtful to Catholics, I don't want them upset, bashing me. Okay. What about First Maccabees? Oh, holy water hose or something. Okay. Dude, this can hurt though. Um, I hear that water place. can be kind of hot. Yeah. That was nine. Something true or false? Something Daniel's vision of the Lord refers to papacy. Ten. What yeah. was Daniel's reaction to seeing Gabriel? What was Daniel's reaction to seeing Gabriel? By the way. Gabriel, man or woman? He, she. What? No race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No gender. But no gender. <laughs> if you had to pick one. Male. Yeah, male. Yeah, male. male. Angels male. are referred to in the masculine. Yeah, that's it. But I will say, maybe Constantine. Gabriel now, shows the name Gabriel, if you put an A in the end, it, it becomes a female name, right? Gabriella. Just like Michael, you put an A on the end of it, it's Michaela. Isn't that funny? Gow. You know, what's also funny is that A, in most words, negates the word. Like, theist believes in God. Atheist believes there's no God. Huh. So, an A at the end of a name feminizes it. I'm just kidding, not really. So, does that mean... Like, so, does that mean everything that's, like, 
cool about Michael. It's no longer Parkura. cool. Parkura. Uh, that's gross. Chrissa. That sounds like a girl. That kind of does sound like a girl. Wow. We, we, Sarah. Well, that's already done. Marka? If Parker, Sarah, be, if Parker yeah. was a girl's name, it would be Parkeet. Jetta. Jetta. <laughs> Joshua. Buck. Joshua. Buck. Josiah. Setha. Uh, mm. Marka. Marka. Baba. Marka. Marka. Baba. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll give you a bonus. Oh no. Bonus. Oh no, you mean oh yes. Oh no. Free credit. Oh, yeah. How would you answer an objection by critics? Right? Those critics out there. How would you answer an objection by critics that Darius the Mede couldn't have taken over Babylon because it was historically the Persians that occupied it? What was that? I'm going to... Refresh your memory here. The Bible says, and Darius the Mede came in and was king over Babylon. But the Medes were a puny little power compared to Persia. Persia, historically, is the one that took over Babylon, and we know that. The Medo-Persian Empire, and the Persians were the real strength of that. So how would you answer a critic if a critic said, there's no way that Darius the Mede could have been king because... The Medes did not take over Babylon. It was the Persians that were the primary ones that occupied it. So how would you answer that objection by critics? That the Bible's wrong. Medes weren't powerful enough to take over Babylon. It was mainly the Persians. So the Bible's wrong. All right, as soon as you're done, swap. Please. And question number one, Gabe. It says, true or false, the Belshazzar was the first son of Nebuchadnezzar. False. False. Why is that false? Isn't Belshazzar what they call Daniel? Uh, no, that's Belt-Shazzar. Uh, but it's still true. false. Do you know why? That's what I thought. Belshazzar is a king. He's also, I think he's referred to, no, no. Anyway, yeah, he's still a king. Do you know why? Um, well, it refers, it refers to um, Nebuchadnezzar as his father, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's his direct father. It just kind of means ancestor. Ancestor, exactly. There's no Hebrew distinction in that word that means there's no Hebrew word for grandson or son or great grandson or father or great grandfather. I mean usually you have to yeah, you have to do that. So the question would have been true if I said Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Well technically that's true. He is a son down the line. But I said first son and that's not true. I believe Nabonidus would have been the first. There may have been another in between. I always get these sorry camera, I always get these goofed up. But uh and remember, I think it was Nabonidus who was so hated by his people. He was religious and hated that they, like, booted him out and, like, get out of here. And so he went to worship over in Arabia somewhere. And Belshazzar, his son, stepped in and oh, okay. ran like a king, basically. Religious. So they would have been seen as a king. For a long time, people thought the Bible was inaccurate because of that. And then history verifies it. A couple of different sources. Number two, what key event in Nebuchadnezzar's life caused him, this is to you, Gabe, caused him to no longer send out military or brag about idols? The event with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Nope, not that one. Darn. Parker, uh, we talked about this. There's a marked difference in his life. The dream God gave him. Is what gave him. Uh, the, he got multiple dreams. All right. But one of those are the dreams. Uh, you want me to be more specific? Yeah, I wanted to know. I want what I wanted to know wasn't the dream. It te I can't give you that because it wasn't technically the dream. It was. I let him know, and then it happened to him. Yes, it was seven years of insanity. Yeah. Seven times of insanity. Exactly mm -hmm. like an animal. Yes, yeah. God. It's not that God said, "I'm going to humble you." Big whoop. He didn't care. 
God did humble them. That's what changed. So probably seven years. It just says seven times. So a complete amount of time. He's like a wild animal. You remember this part, right? Like he walked out and he's like, wow, look at this amazing battle. It was a year later after the dream. I mean, you'd think, this is going to happen. And he walk out, look at this battle that I made. It's beautiful. And then bam, God struck him. And he turned insane. He let his hair and his nails grow out. He was eating grass and running around like an animal. And right after, after that happened, he wrote it down, at least in Daniel, you know, he, he let it be known that, all right, I'm respecting this God now because clearly he can do what he wants. And he doesn't brag about his gods anymore, and he doesn't send out military after that point. Remember, we talked about this. There's a mm -hmm. historical difference that happens there. It's kind of funny that verifies. all the stuff that happened before, though, didn't really change him. It took well, him having some sort of like real physical experience. Oh, yeah, that's experience. true. That's true. Maybe he was a, still a skeptic. He was like, well, they clearly have a powerful god, but distant powerful god, or, you know, this secret magic arts that I need to master, or something like that. Who knows? <clears throat> it's hard to put our minds back there, though, because they were very superstitious, too, so yeah. he could have, like, but who knows, maybe he's thinking, well, maybe Marduk is working through them in a special way, because they still had their Babylonian um, god. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Alright, back to you, Gabe. Get this one right. True or false? The gods praised in Belshazzar's feast were probably Marduk, Nebo, Nurgle, and Ishtar. True. That is true. Good job. Good um, job. That is true. That's what we said, probably, so we don't know. Parker, true or false? Book of Daniel is written in oh, chronological order. Uh, uh, false. Yes, that is false. It seems like false is going to be your safe answer in almost any Old Testament book. They just didn't care about chronology as much. Kind of like C. We sure do. It's the way we think. But according to them, oh, that reminds me. I need to say something on a note about Daniel when we get started. So kind okay. of forget that. Um, so, so question five: How many beasts were in Daniel's vision in chapter seven, Gabe? Four. The four beasts. Yep. Both the beasts in seven and the statue in two represent what? Um, uh, upcoming nations. Yeah, nations. I'll accept nations. Upcoming nations, that's fine. Seven, what symbolic slash bodily appendage indicates swiftness and power? Beast had it. Which one? What is it? Wings. Wings! Fly like an eagle. That's right. And then which one indicated might or strength? Uh, horns. The horn! Or horns, yeah. Good job. True or false? It's number nine. Some think Daniel's vision of the little horn that... Swallowed up was it three other horns or four? Three, I think it was. It refers to the Pope or the papacy. Does anyone think that game? True. Yeah, there are people who think that. We said probably not, but it's possible. You know, I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> um, ten. How was Daniel's, or yeah, what was Daniel's reaction to seeing Gabriel? He fainted. He fainted. His legs gave way and collapsed. The man who sleeps with lions faints at the sight of, sight of angels. How would you answer the objection by critics? Ooh, Gabe, you get a fun one. How would you answer their objection that says that there's no way Darius the Mede was king? The Medes didn't take over. It was mainly the Persians. The Medes weren't strong enough. It was only because of the Persians that they took over. So Daniel's wrong. How would you answer them? I would say that the Medes <coughs> and the Persians worked together. Yes. And so the Persians sent someone from the Medes to rule Babylon. Okay, okay. Wait a minute. But the Bible says that the Medes took over Babylon. Yeah, but they're together, so it's saying that they took over but it, it can't be at the time. You're, you're not understanding, though. The Medes are not strong enough to take over Babylon. There's just no way that the King Darius and the Medes would have been the ones. Because the Bible just says that the Medes took over Babylon. What's that? I don't know, then. 
No, you're actually giving me the right answer. I just want you to elaborate more. I want you to, I want you to uh, shoot me down. Uh, okay. I'm just uh, sounding confident. Well. Because I'm confident, therefore I'm right. Right. Well, if uh. Like right there, you're zoning in all around it. You just haven't landed on it. I'm waiting for you to land on. It. I'm specifically asking. <clears throat> What I'm specifically, everything you're telling me is right, but what I'm saying is that the Bible has to be wrong because the Medes were not strong enough to occupy that region, and the Bible says that the Medes took over. So then... And everything you're saying is right, but there's just one detail I wish you would add. Parker, can you add this detail? Or give, I'll give you one more shot, and then Parker's going to try to add it. Is that the, the term Medes... Is just used uh, to mean both. I don't know. Um, you're probably right, Parker. Can you have you zoned in on it? <sighs> no. I'm telling you guys something that's false. That's why I'm hoping you catch me. Uh, say it again. I'm saying the Bible says that the Medes took over Babylon, and the Medes were not strong enough to take over Babylon. So therefore, we know this is historically inaccurate. It was the Persians. Are you, saying, are you saying that the Medes were strong enough to take over? No, I'm saying that's what the Bible claims, and it's wrong. We know historically it's wrong, so therefore the book of Daniel is wrong. It was the Persians. Oh, historically, is it not wrong? No, his, you're, you're confusing the issue again. Historically, the, the Bible, the fact that the Bible says that the Medes took over... Um, and does not mention Persia, but it mentions the Medes and their king Darius, proves that it's inaccurate because it was the Persians that took over. Well, it wasn't not necessarily the that they like took over, was it? It was the fact that the one king, or whatever the king's name, Belshazzar or whatever, mm -hmm. he died, and Darius was, um, what was his position? He had king. I mean, I might have misunderstood it, but I didn't think it was like a conquering thing. I thought it was like a... Oh, well, it was. King, it was king. an opportunistic conquering thing, I think. Okay, give yourself half credit. And if you got what he got, then give yourself half credit. I didn't write anything, so... <laughs> well, that's too bad. I gave myself... The, the only other thing I was really hoping you'd catch me on is that the Bible does not say the Medes took over. All it says was oh. Darius became king, and Darius was a meat. Oh, okay. You see that? So it doesn't specifically say, and we mentioned that in class, it doesn't say that the Medes took over. It says that Darius the Mede became king. So it's acknowledging the fact that, yeah, there, we know historically there was that alliance, and it just so happens that there, the leader was a meat. Big whoop. Doesn't mean that Persia wasn't involved. Does that make sense now? You yeah. see that? So I was telling you something wrong the whole time. I kept saying it says the Medes took up. And by the way, if you encounter a critic, that's exactly what's probably, exactly what's probably, that's funny when I say that. That is most likely, I would say 98% of the time, what's going to happen. They're going to quote information slightly off and expect you to answer it, and you're going to be stumped. And the reason is they mishandle the information probably 99% of the time. I mean, majority of the time. That's what's going to happen. So what does the verse actually say? It just says that Darius, Darius the Mede became king. Something to that effect. That's right. So you have, to, you have to listen very carefully because you know how people, it's a loaded question. People assume, you know, they, oh, they yeah. uh, assume oh, yeah, something that's not true. And that's why they can't answer the question themselves and they think they're going to stump you. But usually the question, they frame the question wrong and that's why. See, I didn't, I didn't answer it because I didn't understand your question. I was like, man, I must have missed something big. Yeah. Well, I was hoping you'd remember the discussion on that. Because if you didn't remember the discussion, then it is kind of hard. Well, I didn't. Is that? But you would have answered this question perfectly if you had gotten in an argument with a critic right before class about it. No, oh, yeah. Probably. Does that have to do? Thankfully, no. Not this one. All right. Um, please pass those in. I'll collect up your work afterwards. <laughs> We're going to talk about grades and stuff, too, because we're coming to the end, and you guys are making it, but you're cutting it a little closer than I like, so I want to strengthen and encourage you to spread the finish. I need to play close to the chess. <laughs> so uh, I want to say something before we get started. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 9. 
Um, I'll queue up my Bible while I'm doing that. But the and Roger Chambers taught me this. And it's about apocalyptic literature. In Daniel chapter nine. Well, not even the whole book of Daniel is filled with apocalyptic literature. What is apocalyptic literature? References to the end times. No, not necessarily. Sometimes it includes that, but just because um, just because the end times are there, it may not always talk about the end times. It's, it's very, something else. Very figurative. It is very figurative, and it's written so that <laughs> others can understand it. it's written in a way so that a certain people group can understand it and others won't. Okay, you're thinking of like Revelation and, and you're onto something. The word apocalyptic means hidden. The apocrypha are the hidden books of the Bible. I make it sound so mysterious, but the idea is it's hidden. So what is it? Well there's an element of the meaning that is hidden. It's mysterious. It's hard to it's like what is it really talking about? It's representing something else, and the meaning might be kind of hidden from you, you know. So that's what apocalyptic literature is. And you start answering the question, why? Why might it be used? Well, sometimes it is just for its hiding purposes, like possibly in the book of Revelation. If he wants to talk about the overthrow of Rome, it might not be a good thing to write and put out there for the whole world that Rome's going to be annihilated. You might want to call it Babylon, or, you know, call it... a a large nation that everyone would recognize, okay, Babylon's a lot like Rome today. I think he's talking about Rome, you know. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And I'm not necessarily sure that he's always talking about Rome when he says Babylon. Just, you know, I don't want you to take that too far. But uh, something like that. So, but Chambers pointed out something that is very, that helped me out a lot, and I hope it helps you. In the book of Daniel, a couple of things. Daniel popularized apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. Daniel was kind of the one to get that started. You, you, you really, as far as I know, can't trace it back, at least biblically, much further or any further than him. He's the one that kind of got it popular among the Jews and among others. And it has another really unique purpose. And it, it's so simple when you think about it. In, um, in those days... If you want to, if you want to uh, document something that happened, right? You want to make sure not just document it. You want to get the news out for everyone. Well, how are you going to do that? I mean, we don't have the printing press, and for that matter, how do you get paper? Well, no, you don't get paper very easily. I mean, you got to kill an animal and use their skin. You got to get that the reeds grown in Egypt, which is this tough, thick. I mean, kind of thick. It's not easy to press out. It's a lot of work. You have to know how to write. You have to have ink. Where's that ink coming from? You know, all these headaches in the way. And then your kid, you know, spills the uh, you know, spills the milk on your manuscript, and it's a big deal. I mean, it's right. So it's it's hard. So a lot of times, how did the Jews pass on information? How did the Jews get the word of God out to all the people if they can't give them a copy of the Bible? What did they do? Uh, these people. They, they use people, but how? I know. If, if you can't know. write it, what else can you do? I know where you're going, but um, good. I'm glad you do. So help me get there. I don't, I don't know this point. Well, yeah, you do. What? How did the Jews get the information of Scripture to everyone else if they couldn't write them a copy? What did they do? They brought them one. No. Yes, you do. You guys know this, and maybe I'm asking it in a bad way, but it's so simple. What is the answer? Oh my goodness, now you're making me feel bad. Like, if you can't even read or write, and yet I want to share the Bible speak with you, it. what am I going to do? I'm going to speak it. I'm going to... I didn't hear you say that, sorry. It's referred to, a lot of times it's referred to as the oral tradition. They would, one, one person would read, they would come to the synagogue too later on, that one person would read from the law, and all these people would be there so they could hear it, right? Because you don't have a copy at home most of us don't so that's how they spread their teaching right well when you do that there's the risk of forgetting things or getting details mixed up and the jews were really amazing at keeping the oral tradition going and one thing that helps is when you got a classroom of 50 people or whatever and then one person's reading and then you have all these little variants but you can pair all 50 people together and you can kind of reproduce way more accurately it's like if you have one witness to an accident 
versus 50 witnesses to an accident. The 50 is going to give you a much greater detail of every little thing in that accident, whereas the one might have seen this car and that person and missed this. You know, oh, I didn't see the dog run across the road. I just saw this semi flying in the air, you know, things like that. Well, so, uh, oral tradition is how we do that. Well, if you really wanted someone to remember something, and you guys know how this works, if you want to remember something, the more extravagant it is, the more outlandish it is, the more likely you are to remember it, because it's just unusual. Gabe was walking home the other day because his car blew another tire, right? And he looked over, and he saw, he saw the, uh, um, what was it? Oh, he, he saw the restaurant um, Olive Garden. He looked over and saw the restaurant Olive Garden. Called the Olive Garden. And there was a person walking kind of underneath the sign, kind of cutting through. Now, three weeks from now, Gabe, uh, if asked about it, might not even remember that day that he was walking home. He might remember that. But the odds of him remembering that person, pretty slim. But he might remember that if I asked him, did you see anyone that day on your walk home? Uh, well, I think I saw a person. You know, and I said, well, describe him, every detail. He probably couldn't give me much, just a few little things, you know, long hair, short hair, guy, girl, you know, simple things like that. <laughs> but let's have the same scenario. Gabe's walking home from work and looks over by the Olive Garden side, and it is Bigfoot. It is definitely Bigfoot. I mean, the most accurate form in your mind of what Bigfoot would look like. And then three weeks later, I asked you about, did you see anything in your way home? Can you give me more details on Bigfoot? Yeah. I'm going to bet you can, because that's not something you see every day, right? That's there. I was walking home the other day, and Bigfoot was in Olive Garden. What? <laughs> but I would stare at it more, too. Yeah, you would, because it would get your attention, right? Sure. Sure. But the point is, even if we'll just say a person ran across the road, and you'd be like, hmm, wow, that's something. Bigfoot ran across the road. You'd stare at it equally, but Bigfoot... Three weeks later, you would keep that in your memory bank, yeah, probably. Right. Whereas the person, you'd be like, weirdo, j yeah. or whatever. So, apocalyptic literature, well, what is it? A lot of times when you read it, it's not just a plain old, and this person went over and did that, the end. It is, and the dragon came, and he knocked over a third of the stars, and they came crashing to Earth. Number one, that's scientifically impossible. You know, it's figurative. But number true, number true, <laughs> numero true, no. That's not something you forget, right? A, a giant dragon knocking stars out of the sky? Can you, like, if you picture that, especially in a day and age when there's no TV, there's no writing utensils, I should say, there are writing utensils, but rarely do people have them. A lot of people can't even read. But you tell them stories and stories that are, like, amazing like that, they're going to remember that, right? They, they are. Just like if we, um, just like songs and stuff. People remember songs. You remember things that happen on your TV show from way back when because it's like, oh yeah, you know, it was crazy. So does that make sense? Apocalyptic literature help people remember the story. If you remember that the dragon actually represents this, Satan or whatever, and that the stars represents, well, just the power that he had. He was, instead of saying Satan is powerful, if you said the seven-headed dragon knocked a third of the stars out of the sky, you got this visual image that you're like, Whoa, and then you connect it to Satan, you realize he's powerful. So mm -hmm. apocalyptic literature serves as a memory aid, too. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I wasted too much time saying that. So that's what I wanted you guys to remember when we talk about Daniel. That's probably a good test question, too. <coughs> so start next to it, chapter 9, verse 1. Um, let's see. We'll get, we'll get started. Let's go ahead and read the uh, first four verses. <clears throat> I'll kick us off with... Uh, in the word of the Lord came to me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, huh? All right, I'll start. Gabe, you go next, and then Parker. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, by descendant Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, <laughs> chapter 9, verse 2. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. <coughs> oh, that's all right. We'll skip you. Go ahead, Parker. Read verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived... 
yeah, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay, Jeremiah 25, 11 is a reference you can write down for that. Jeremiah 25, 11. Isn't it cool, though, that he referred to Jeremiah in the first place? Yeah. And what is the 70 years that he's talking about? 70 years of um, the enslavement or whatever. Exile, yeah. Exile. 70 years of exile in Babylon. Well, that 70 years is nearing an end, and you remember, wait, Jeremiah said 70 years. What's next? You know. So that's kind of cool. All right, verses 5 up to 14. <coughs> I'm just making notes, sorry. <clears throat> we have sinned and done wrong and, and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which ye have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our priests, or princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. For we have rebelled against him. And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice and the, cor oh, and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words by which he, sp or which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written... In the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. All right, um, pretty straightforward stuff. What is he talking about, though? Do you remember what he's talking about when he says the curses? When Moses was leaving, how he told them if they don't continue to do the law, this thing's easy to happen. Yeah, yeah, excellent. There are numerous places, or a number of different ones, uh, but Leviticus 26.14... Leviticus 26.14, Deuteronomy 28.15... Deuteronomy 28, 15, as well as 29, 18. So Leviticus 26, 14, Deuteronomy 28, 15, and 29, 18. Those are some of the references to the curses. And you remember, you know, they would even read the law, curse be anyone who does this, and all the people say amen. Curse be the person who does this, and all the people say amen. And they made it pretty clear in other, like what you're saying too, if you're going to not serve God anymore, then these are the curses he's going to do. One of them was withholding the rain. And so a faithful prayer warrior named Elijah prayed to God, God, take away the rain, because that's what God said he would do. And then God did for three and a half years. What was the Leviticus one? 26.14. 26.14, okay. So 
this, what is Daniel doing here? He's confessing, but he's not really just confessing his own sin. What is he confessing? He's confessing the sins of the people as well. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do that? Intercession. Yeah, I guess it's intercession, but wouldn't intercession... All right, let me ask you this then. Intercession for sure. Well, why didn't he intercede by just praying for them? Say, God, please, please help and forgive my people. They have done all these bad things and they need your help. Why didn't he just ask for help instead of spending a bunch of time confessing their sins instead of his own? Any ideas? Um, kind of the idea I have is that he was wanting to... Well, it says in verse 3 that he presents him, oh, he, he starts off by fasting and putting his sack, sackcloth and ashes and everything. I think it was just that it was like an act of like humbling oneself. And so I think it's one of those things where he's humbling himself before God. He's throwing out everything on the table and just being like, hey, this is what we've done. This is how dirty we are. And yeah. I mean, he basically spends 13 verses saying that mm -hmm. until he finally asks for something. Yeah. I think maybe, like you said, he's getting his mind in the right frame where he's recognizing that um, in this confession he is not only identifying with the people, but he is identifying with God saying, God, I, I know we are really bad. And the fact that he verbalizes these, these things makes it more and more real that he's really bad, um, that the people have really messed up. But also... Um, I think one of the reasons is just the overall scriptural theme that we're connected. We're not, it's not an individual faith. Um, sure, we have individual belief and stuff like that, but um, um, true Christianity and true faith in God involves everyone altogether. It's us. It's his people. So you can't, um, in the New Testament, 1 John, he talks about you can't love God, if you don't love your brother, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the same principle seems to be true in the Old Testament as well, and you pick up hints of it in these prayers. Um, all of us together, if you guys are all sinning and I'm doing great, we're sinning. It doesn't matter because I'm responsible for you as well, so therefore I need to confess to God because I'm uh, messing up. And, and that's, I think that's a concept that we need to get better. You guys have it pretty well, but... One of the reasons why D groups and the idea of confessing sins today is so difficult is because our culture has individualized Christianity so much. Um, it's, it's about our personal relationship with God. But biblically, no, it's not about our personal relationship with God. Biblically, it's about our collective relationship with God as well as our personal. You know what I mean? So a lot of us have kind of... Well, Reading verses like this might be a good way to get us to realize that, hey, we we need to confess each other's sins too, hmm. not just our own. It's not an individual thing. It is a group thing. And what you're doing, even though you think it's between you and God, it affects me and it affects all of us. Um, remember, too, uh, what we studied in Ezekiel, even if Daniel was there among other righteous people praying, the city still would have been destroyed. It might have saved Daniel, but the city would have been destroyed because the sin was that strong. So Daniel couldn't have saved his own city. It was going to affect him too, you know, if he was one of the people there in Jerusalem trying to pray for it. So, anyway, in the do Old think, Testament. Do you think with that reference, uh, this is something I thought um, mm -hmm. a while ago, it says that even the prayers of these guys would be able to save them from mm -hmm. what's coming do you think maybe that might imply that there were some people who... What in the world? Do you think there maybe were some people who were actually maybe following God in the city, but it's just like, hey, you, nothing you really can do can stop this? It's entirely possible. It's entirely That's possible, and my guess is God delivered them or helped them out in a certain way. But we can't be sure. It's also entirely possible that they went down with everyone else because all the people were sitting and they were yeah. able to change them, you know. And I can accept that. I mean, that's that's what happens. Good people hang around a bad crowd all the time and they get in trouble for it. Well, we understand that's, that's the repercussions of that. Well, you could be a good follower of God, but if you can't get the people that you're around to follow in line with you, 
then whatever they suffer, you're going to be suffering there by being with them. But that's sometimes that's what you need to do anyway, you know. But don't be surprised by it. Don't blame God like he did something wrong, you know. He didn't. Uh, well, let's keep going. I think you guys understand that really well. But if you're dealing with, when you go to a church and you work there, or a mission field or whatever, and they're tied up in an American culture, verses like this need to be emphasized a little bit more. He didn't. He could have just skipped and confessed his own sins. He, he could have just asked for forgiveness, but he felt it important to spend 13 verses confessing everyone's sins together. Why? Why is it when the restoration happened, I believe it was in the time of Ezra, or maybe it also happened in Nehemiah, the people would come together and they confess their sins for like the better part of a day. Why do they have to have this mass confession time as a large group of people? Well, apparently, this confession thing has a little bit of weight to it that we kind of push aside today, you know. We, we say individualize it instead of, but there is a place for public confession. So, uh, let's read 15 through 27. I think it gets interesting here. Um, I don't know who was last. I'll pick up. Go for it. <clears throat> And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as, as at this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be the idea is like we're still, we've sinned. You know, even up to this present day, after all this stuff you've done for us, we've sinned. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because of our sins, for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. What's a byword mean? What is that? Um, as long as you get the flavor of the word. I mean, a byword would mean what? Like, I don't know, a past thought or something? Or Yeah, um, almost like a... What's that? Like an example, brother. A negative one, like yeah. a. Like God, um, I'm not gonna do what that person did. Your name will be Mud. Well, if a guy, if there was really a guy named Mud, well, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like that. I wish I could think of a better example today, though. But like, you know, somebody's name can stand for something else, and it can be pretty bad. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Hmm. But somebody who's really stupid. Like hey, John. Well, like the the. Uh, Positive would be like, okay, Einstein. Well, that's using the name a little bit like a byword, but at the same time, it could be like a compliment. You're like saying, yeah, you're really smart, whatever, you know, I don't like that. But Einstein is being used not to say that you have frizzy hair or whatever, but that your intelligence, you know, things like that. Cool. All right, keep going, sorry. It's your turn. What verse are we on? I got distracted. I Thank you. Uh, now, therefore, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. <clears throat> o my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. <clears throat> he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, 
and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore the built or build, uh, restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the or an anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again, uh, with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. And after sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offer. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decree end is poured out on the desolator. Okay. We can, let's go ahead and pause there, because that finishes up chapter 9 anyway. Okay, this is interesting. Um, well, I think he goes into more detail in chapter 10. Does it say how long he was praying in chapter 9? Did, you, did we read that anywhere? I didn't see that. Okay, I didn't need it. I think that's in chapter 10. This is that. All right, now we are getting into the fun stuff, the stuff that um, crazy people will come to your door talking about, or stuff that you'll tune in to. A religious station not that you would ever you probably flip past one and they'll be talking about this they love this stuff because we start doing calculations and math and you see like the dates start flying in people's minds and stuff so let's see if we can make some sense out of this in chapter 9 he's talking about the 70 years right the 70 years of decree now 70 years of exile Daniel prays and says, you know, God, what's going to happen? You know, confessing our sins. So God answers him. That, well, let's not gloss over that fact that Daniel's such a faithful person that, oh, Daniel's praying. Gabriel, get down there. Tell him now. Yeah, I mean, it really is. And yet he cannot save the city in Ezekiel by his prayers. But yet he was clearly a man of God, so much so, and he's known for praying three times a day. You know, it was his habit. So God sent him now with an answer, and the answer is surprisingly specific, too. He said, you know, how long, God? What's going to happen next? So he says, Gabriel, tell him. And he does. 70 weeks. So what does he tell him? He says, he says 70 weeks. Mm. Yes, thank you. Creed. The 70 years are coming to an end. <clears throat> and then he says, 70 sevens. 70 weeks. A week is a period of seven. That would also be known as a heptad, just so you know, heptad, group of seven, a period of seven. Mm -hmm. So 70 heptads are commanded for you guys. Now, let's see how we can do that. 70 periods of seven. By the way, when I looked at that, I realized, I was like, wait a minute. Remember when Jesus, you know, the apostles said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. It's just interesting that... That's the same thing that Daniel is talking about here. So, and keep in mind, sevens are highly symbolic. A lot of numbers are used symbolically all the time in the Bible. How do we know that? Well, we use numbers symbolically too. You're like, I told you once, I told you a thousand times. Not literally a thousand times. That just means I told you a whole bunch of times, you know. So we use numbers symbolically too, but even more so back then. You know, ten thousands upon ten thousands. Well, it's probably saying a whole lot. So, seven, 70 times. Now, these are um, from the command to restore. All right, let's do that. Let's break this down one at a time. What we're talking about here, by the way, is most likely years instead of periods of days. We're probably talking about 70 times seven in the amount of years. And there is a good reason for that. I just can't think of it right now but maybe it'll become more clear in there. But a lot of times that's the way the term's used. 70 times seven, and usually if it's just a time, we don't know, but a lot of times years are a safe thing to assume. Command to restore. Uh, 
that would be um, given by Jeremiah. That would be, let's see, either we have Cyrus, and if it's Cyrus, it would be 538 BC. So that's a possibility. Cyrus 538 BC, or a better time would be this one. I'm going to vote for this one, and it's going to be Ezra. And that would be 48, wait, wait, that would be 457 BC. And there are other, there are other dates vying for, you know, placement here. But 70 times 7 from the command to restore, uh, and that would be referenced to Jeremiah. Well, what is that? It could be Cyrus. What, what did Cyrus command to restore exactly? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. So, sorry, forget Jeremiah. The command to restore, I should have put Jerusalem there. So you didn't mean Jeremiah? I did not mean Jeremiah, sorry. Yeah, I was kind of confused what you mean. Yeah, the command to restore Jerusalem. See, I abbreviated it in my notes. I was like, J-E-R. Like, Jeremiah, no. The yeah. command to restore Jerusalem. So 70 years from a command to restore Jerusalem, or the command, to this other event that's going to happen. Well, what is that command? Is it Cyrus in 538 B.C.? Possibly. Smith likes this one, and I kind of like it too. Ezra in 457 has a great religious restoration, which is the kind that really matters more anyway. And the dates seem to line up better with this. So I'll vote this one. It may be others, but Ezra in 457 BC. I want you to see where this lines up if you follow this train of thinking, right? So seven weeks, um, and he breaks this up into two periods. Actually, three. We'll get to that. Uh, command to restore Jerusalem. Then we have the anointed one. Oops, anointed one, also called the prince. Some say this and some say that. What's that? Some say this and some say that. All right, the anointed one and prince. Probably, by the virtue of the fact that it says anointed one, who is also royalty, we're probably talking about Christ there, because prophet, priest, king. So we're going to vote Jesus on this one. Vote Jesus on that. Um, Jesus present, 2015. And then, okay. And then it says seven weeks are decreed, right? It breaks it up into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then another week. Is that right? If, if you look through it. Mm -hmm. So... Seven weeks. That's fun stuff. Seven weeks are declared. That would be a period of what? Seven times seven? Fourteen. Forty-nine. Hundred forty. No, that's not Seven weeks of years. Forty-nine years, right? Well, what happens? Um, seven weeks would, would be forty-nine years. That would equal. The time it took to rebuild Jerusalem. So rem remember, um, historically what happens is Ezra comes down with the people. There are groups of people that come back. Ezra comes down and begins to rebuild Jerusalem and has major religious restoration starts to build the walls too, but he's not allowed to. He wasn't okayed by the king, so he can't. And Nehemiah comes down, and he's the one that finishes the job. Now, a city back in those days wasn't really considered a city until you have the walls up. But 49 years is about the time it took for the entire city of Jerusalem to come back and get its walls and to become a city again, right? So that kind of makes sense. Can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay. Did we discuss that seven weeks just represents years? Like weeks represents it, it, years? What it says is seven times. Um, yeah. Well, let's look at that again. Let's look at the actual verse. Because we did briefly mention it, but I may have to look more carefully at my notes. <laughs> Oh no. Uh, do, 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 do. What does it start 
we're talking about. We're talking four. Let's see. Seventy weeks are declared about your people in your holy city. Little footnote there. There shall be seven weeks, then sixty-two weeks. Week a time. It shall be. Weeks. Yeah. Again. See, it doesn't. The the thing. Literally, what the Hebrew is saying is seventy sevens. Where do you see that? <laughs> weeks is seven. Right. It's it, you see when I say week, you automatically assume seven days. But if I said seven, you'd be like what? Seven hours? Oh. Days? Years? Millennia? I see what you're saying. So if it literally says seventy sevens, um. Yeah, it's up for debate. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Days, years, but years is probably makes the most sense because when we trace all this, it, and I think most people are actually going to, even even a lot of the people that are way out there, when you start with the beginning, the seven years and the 62, they're going to agree with this too because it kind of fits pretty well historically. But yeah, I'm sorry, that's that's probably the basic reason why because days is an assumption too, you know. <clears throat> So you think because it says weeks, it's telling you it's a times by seven. Well, let me look and see. It says, sure, the word up. is, it is, the Hebrew. Shavuim, which is translated week or seven. Interesting. So it could mean days, could mean period of seven. But um, it makes most sense when you translate it years. No, not, not necessarily, because there is, like, the Feast of Weeks, and since it happened every year, it's the Feast of Sevens, but we know it happened every year, so therefore it had to be a seven-day feast. You know no, what I mean? For this verse. But for this, the reason why, and there are probably better reasons than this, but the reason why I think years make sense is because, is it just a coincidence that it lines up with right. historical events? Okay. I, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's meant to be understood that way. Okay. But... Since we are dealing with numbers, it could just be highly symbolic anyway, and we may be making a whole lot out of nothing. But even that withstanding, I want you guys to be aware of this because people are obsessed with it. Yeah. So I'd rather you guys hear a little bit okay. on the subject. But yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So that's going to be our rationale for going with weeks for now. But let's keep going and see what you okay. think, you know, because it, it may help piece things together a little bit. So, anointed one prince, seven weeks, 49 years, that's the amount of time that it took to rebuild Jerusalem. At least that's probably what it's talking about. <clears throat> then, we have 62 weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, fill up this word. All right, 62 weeks. Well, how long is that? That's going to be 400, if we do the math here, 483 years. 62 weeks, 483 years. Well, what happens during that period of 483 years? Well, this is interesting. 62 weeks, I'm sorry, why did I say 483? There are too many numbers. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. 434 years. 62 times 7, 434 years of time. Until what? 434 years until the anointed one, the prince, comes, till the Messiah comes. Alright? That's the time until Jesus comes. Or I'll just put until Messiah. That makes it it's more accurate. Until Messiah. So so far, let's see where we're at here. 77s will occur. That is, 77s will uh, occur starting from this time. So that's kind of our, this is our sub, this is our title, right? Angel comes, there is this period of 77s from the command to restore Jerusalem until uh, this other thing comes. Now let me break that down. And then he goes into detail. Um, he uses terms like the anointed one prince. We're talking about Jesus. Now, what does that 77 look like? Well, it starts with a period of seven. That's 49 years, probably talking about the time it took to rebuild Jerusalem. That would make sense. Then after the seven, 62 more weeks. That's a period of 434 years. 
until the anointed one, the prince, the Messiah comes. 62 plus 7, that's a total of 69 weeks. You put these two together, this plus this, here we'll even do it this way, this plus this equals what? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, carrier 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, 483 years. Right? Did I do my math right? 49 plus 434 is 483. Yeah. A total of 69 years, I mean 69 weeks of years equals 483 years. Well, is there anything significant about that time? What I think is really cool is if you line this up, you know where you end up? No. 483 years later from this time is right at Jesus' baptism. See that? Yeah. So there's going to be a period of 77s. The first seven, the time it takes to build Jerusalem, then 62 more. And by the time you've gone through that, you're right at Jesus' baptism historically. Hmm. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, is that just a coincidence? I mean, maybe. It, it just doesn't seem like it to me. When he talks about the Messiah coming, yeah. the anointed one, the prince, and then he lines it up right at Jesus' baptism. Let's look at the verse again, though, because this gets confusing, and I don't want us to lose track here. Uh, so 70, in verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, and atone for iniquity. So that's what's going to happen. Transgression over, finish up sin, get rid of iniquity, atone for iniquity. Well, you remember the definition of atonement? You know you remember the definition of atonement? At one moment. At one. Two parties are separated, but they're at one meant. That's how you spell it, at one meant. So the two come together to become one. Well, 70 weeks until that happens. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, to anoint the most holy place. Know, therefore, that the time of the going out of the word to restore Jerusalem, the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks... Seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again um, with squares and moat, but in troubled time. Then after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And into the end there shall be war desolations are decreed. Then he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and the wing of abomination shall come oh, wait, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So that's where we are. Keep going in. So, Jesus' is death. Um, what is the uh, the cutoff? 483 years till Jesus' baptism. Then the anointed one gets cut off. Well, that's probably going to be... I guess i got to go over here now. It's probably going to be Jesus' death. Right? Because, yeah, Jesus came back, he was baptized, he, he was the anointed one and stuff, but then he was cut off, killed on a cross. Um, so that's being cut off after 69 weeks. So then, who comes? Well, a prince comes after that. And this prince, I'm going to vote as the Roman uh, Emperor Titus in AD 70. Because Titus in AD 70 is the one that stepped in and, I mean, killed a million Jews and wiped, wiped out. And by the way, Jesus talks about his coming, too. In Matthew 24 is the main thing. Most of Matthew 24 is talking about um, Titus coming in. Uh, let's see. So we got that. So the prince 
Desolations are decreed. Desolations. What do you think that's going to represent? You sacrifice the goat. Or Probably something. not that. I confuse these all the time, but there's a difference between Antiochus Epiphanes back in 160 BC, 170 BC, and 70 AD. But desolations is probably also referring to the Rome, Romans. Because that's Titus was a Roman who came in and did that. So that's probably what we're talking about. The Romans, and they did what? They sieged Jerusalem. I'll have to write all this. <coughs> sieged Jerusalem from 66 to 70 AD. So desolations would be the Romans, Titus, sieging Jerusalem. It was from 66 to 70. And then that's when Titus came in, 80, 70 million Jews killed, stuff like that. Now, that period of time, by the way, um, during that period of time, the people inside of Jerusalem, they actually, instead of banding together, they turned on each other. There was a lot of chaos and commotion, things like that. So, one week covenant is what comes next. All right, one week covenant. <sighs> See, this is a lot, right? We haven't even gotten into the tough stuff yet. All right, the one week covenant is made by Jesus. Let's do this. So he, Jesus, establishes his covenant for a week. Is and uh. It's not the whole time of the covenant, but only the time it takes to confirm the covenant. That's kind of the key, doesn't it? It says that there in Daniel. It'll take a week to confirm the covenant. It will be one week for that. So what will that seven, um, that one week, which would be seven years, be? Well, this is where the big hang-up comes. This is, this is where, and, and as I recall, um, this is where the we start splitting ways, and then the, the futurists say, "Oh, that you know, it's a big pause, and then like this last week is the entire a you know the Antichrist and all this crazy stuff happens." But if you just take it at face value, the seven years that it's talking about, um, well, think about that. If there's a week from the time of the Anointed One till the covenant is confirmed three and a half years after Jesus was baptized in the very middle of that week which is what it says in Daniel in the middle of the seven years Jesus was killed on the cross yeah. so the one week it takes a week to confirm the covenant first half of the week is the cross i do it this way so and then the second half of this week all right this the second half of this week lines up would be would be obviously about three and a half years later and by the way when it says in the middle of this seven years it doesn't mean it's exactly in the middle it just so happens that the cross is pretty close to being right in the middle though um sacrifices are null and void. And that's the other thing it says. In the middle of this week, the sacrifices are going to be null and void. Well, think. Jesus dying on the cross, what happens to the sacrificial system? They might be killing animals, but it doesn't do them any good anymore, right? So halfway through this week, the sacrifice is going to be done away with. Well, Jesus' death on the cross did away with the need for sacrifices. Right? So if the first 69 weeks lined up at Jesus' baptism... And then later on he talks about some of the things that are going to be happening in AD 70 with Jesus predicted, the Romans, and stuff like that. But after this, he says the one-week covenant is going to be confirmed. Well, halfway through that week, sacrifices is cut off. You don't need them. Second half of that week, we have, where is it? Would be AD 34. And in AD 34, we have a couple of things that could be talking about. 
This is when, when Stephen was stoned. This is also when um, the Christians scattered. And when they scattered, they went off and preached to the Samaritans. Okay, so the Christians scattered, preached to the Samaritans, or Saul, later known as Paul, is converted. Now think about that for a second. It takes one week for the entire covenant to be confirmed. Well, um, the first half of the week, sacrifice and stuff's done away with. Cross makes perfect sense. Second half of the week, AD 34, what was significant about Saul's conversion? Oh, the Christian scattering. Think about that. What was preached significant about Gentiles. that? He preached to the Gentiles. Once, she, once the message has gotten out to the Gentiles, who's left? You got Jews, you got Gentiles. Who's left? That's it. Nobody's left. So, actually in 34 AD, I mean, you could vote for each one of these, but I'm going to go with one of the latter two here. You've got the message going out to non-Jews. The whole covenant's confirmed. Everyone's got it. Hmm. You know what I mean? The message is starting to be preached. So that lines up perfectly with what Daniel's talking about. So sorry for all the confusion. It's really tricky for me to explain, and I'm not sure I have a really firm grasp on this yet. But you see how when you do the math, is it just a coincidence that at the end of these seven years and in the breaking points in between, these 70 sevens, you've got the amount of time it takes to rebuild Jerusalem, you've got the amount of time until Jesus comes, and it lines up right at Jesus' baptism, and then after that, you've got half of you got another week, half of which sacrifice is done away with because of the cross, and then the other half, the message has gotten out to Gentiles. Does that make sense? Because I'm probably going to be asking you about this stuff because people are obsessed with it. it makes but, sense, but at the same time, like to me, it's like pushing it too far. What do you mean? How do you, how do you mean? It we cannot seems, say definitively. Right. It just seems like so. Yeah, like it's a is that something we can really say this is what you have to believe. Absolutely. But the reason why I want you guys to be aware of this is because this is what people do with Daniel, only they make it talk about oh. the end times. Okay, I see. And they're saying the end times is that they'll agree. They probably as will. I recall, they'll agree with a lot of this stuff towards the beginning, but then they'll switch and they'll say, I remember hearing how Lindsay talk about how the prophetic clock stops. Uh, the 69th week it stops and then this last week all kinds of amazing things and perhaps it could be because you know jesus talked about this stuff happening the desolations the prince and stuff like that and that does kind of throw a monkey wrench in things you're like well wait a minute doesn't that's that stuff happened a little bit later um but it doesn't necessarily say chronologically that this stuff will happen in there so i think people see this and because of that, they say, okay, this last week isn't really a week. It's the clock stops, and we've got all of history happening. And then the prophetic clock restarts based on certain signs of the end times that we see. Okay, wait, I saw the desolation. I saw that. That means that there's a little bit of time left for the sacrifices to be. You can see how you can get this really cool, unique story or whatever. But I'm thinking, instead of saying that, instead of saying the prophetic clock stops for 2,000 years, and then it later restarts. Why not just follow it through as it's written chronologically? Right. If you did that, you would end up with these events. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Sacrifice has stopped. Uh, the message had gotten out. The covenant was confirmed to everyone. Doesn't that make more sense than saying that there's going to be a future thing happening? You know what I mean? So I, I want you guys to have an answer for that. But you're right. At the end of the day, I don't have a real strong grasp on this, so I can't dogmatically say that this is how it's going to be. But I'll tell you right now, if we're if I had to pick one, I'm going to pick this yeah. over that. It fits more into our what we believe. Which, it does, which but is. but let's check aside what we believe for now. Almost everyone agrees that this is periods of years. Right. So let's just count the years. 
that's what you end up with. Yeah. Forget what you and I believe. We're just counting. It's counting. It's math. It's yeah. not that hard, right? So something happened from around this time. You either have these starting dates. You could pick this or this. You know, you could choose others. It's debatable. But if we go with this one, it lines up this way. Now, some people will choose this one, and they'll see other events that it lines up. But either way, 77s is a period of 490 years. That's all. It's not 2,000 plus years. It's 490 years. I see no reason to make a prophetic clock stop and then for us to move into the future and see end times and stuff. Isn't that kind of weird? Doesn't it just seem like bad hermeneutics right there? Yeah. So all I'm suggesting is you're right. This coincidentally fits with my, my uh, worldview, my bias in a lot of ways. But just counting is going to bring us somewhere completely different than where those guys are trying to take us, I think. So no, I think it's important. Yeah. But anyway, I want you guys to be aware of this because not only that, but this is really astounding that he would let Daniel see this in the first place. <laughs> and I can only imagine that Daniel might have understood the numbers a little bit better, but the events maybe not because it's all future for him. He's probably wondering. And if the Bible is written for our benefit, I think there's a reason why this stuff was written. And so it's probably for us to derive some benefit from. And I don't know about you, but I derive a bit of benefit from that. Like this really makes, especially when we get to the whole sacrifices and the Gentiles thing. And, and everything in before it, it really fits pretty well. The only question in my mind right now is these things, is how they're thrown in there. And so, I'll look one more time with you guys just to make sure I have a grasp on it. Um, set, verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring everlasting righteousness. From the going out of the word to restore Jerusalem, that's our starting point, to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, and to restore to the coming of this prince, there shall be, uh, there shall be seven weeks. Um, then for 62 weeks after that, the anointed one shall be cut off. The, for, wait, wait, wait. Then for 62 weeks it shall be, well, I just know therefore I understand. Oh, there shall be seven weeks, then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares, moat, and in a troubled time, then after the 62 weeks. I misread that. Then after Jesus' baptism, coincidentally that time, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Okay, that right there is where I've confused you guys, and so let me clarify this. He does not say that he is continuing the chronology here. All he says is, after 69 weeks, after Jesus is here, sometime, any time after that, right, Jesus is going to get cut off, desolations are going to happen. That is when all this stuff happens. Well, when does it happen? After Jesus was here. That's all it's saying. This happened after Jesus was here. Uh, Jesus died. Titus comes in. The Romans, the siege, a million Jews are killed. All kinds of terrible things. Jesus talks about it in his ministry. It really happened. He is not saying that this happened exactly when Jesus was baptized. It just says sometime right. after that it happened, right? But then he picks up the chronology again. Look in that next verse. Uh, it's a, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half the week he shall put. Now the debate, I suppose, is going to be this. Since we just stopped here and we said after that these things are going to happen, and he shall make a covenant for one week, does that mean that this week can get pushed into the future somewhere? Quite possibly. It's entirely possible. But then you've got to debate, well, where are you going to put it? It could be all over the place. Some people are saying it's waits 2,000 years, it's still coming, or you know it's recent or whatever. But what if, is it just possible, Gabe, I'll ask that question, is it possible that he said, this is going to happen, Jesus is going to be here, then after that, we've got some serious stuff coming. Jesus is going to warn you about that, man, it's coming. But, let's pick it up. That person is going to confirm his covenant for a week. 
half halfway through the week, sacrifice is going to be done away with. We've got the cross. The other half is going to line up to where Gentiles are hearing the message. So basically, this is my favorite explanation so far. Doesn't mean it's the only one. There are tons of them out there. But I think, even if this seems like a bit of a stretch to you, I think if you heard the other ones, you'd think, yeah. So I was thinking. Wild. Very wild. But yeah, it's not easy. Which is why people want to come to your door and talk about this passage, because it's so difficult. And who's, I mean, what average Christian's going to know about this stuff? You know, yeah. you know what I mean? You definitely have got that on them. All right. Um, let's, let's go ahead and do a pause here for a mental break. Woo! All right. My brain. Pause this camera. I hope I somewhat explain that well enough. Hey, it's it's kind of challenging. No, I get... I, okay, oh, good, I, good. It's just... You guys are either a, lying to my face or being very nice. <laughs> All right, camera is rolling. It messes on the board. I sure hope I made sense. In the future, I'm going to probably watch this and be like, wow, that made no sense whatsoever. I felt like it was coming together the more I was talking about it. That timeline. That happens. I need to like make a real timeline that's actually good. They are. Okay. Mm. Chapter 10 is a nice, easy little break in the action, as I recall. Kind of fun. So. Let us begin with chapter 10. What a shame, what a shame. I'll go ahead and start because I don't remember where we left off. <clears throat> In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belt Shazar. And, those, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no what in the world? Uh, delicacies, no meat, no wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Now, that's a hint that anointing isn't always for making kings. It's also just for cleaning up our medical purposes or things like that. Just taking care of yourself, hygiene. Mm -hmm. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. Um, all right. <clears throat> his body was like burly, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was <coughs> left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearful, changed, fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. <clears throat> uh, what verse are we on? Sorry. Nine. Nine. Right. Uh, then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep or in deep sleep, with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. I feel like when he says fell into a deep sleep, I think he passed out again. He was trembling, and he's just oh, I'm gonna have to wake up. Yeah. I'm trying to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he, he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12. Sorry, I'm trying to at the same time. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Okay, what he says next is really astounding from a, uh, 
it's a glimpse into the spiritual world. So that's why I think we need to pay attention to it. He said, from the very first day, I was ready to answer your prayer, but he prayed for how long? Look towards the beginning of this chapter. How long had he been praying and fasting? A week. More than that. Um, um, the very beginning, what does it say? It was the three weeks. Three weeks. He prayed for 21 days straight, fasting and everything. So serious prayer. Oh, boy. And from the first day, um, he, you humbled yourself is what it says. Your words were heard. And I have come because of your word. So it's like God sent the sent his angels like, go, go get him. But what happened? Verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, we also know him as an archangel, mm -hmm. came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia. Hmm. <laughs> Verse 14. Right there? Yeah. Can I have a question real quick? Okay, what? I don't know if they'll explain it, but what how does how does one of the kings hold up a an angel? It'll 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 make more sense, I think. Let's keep reading and then we'll get into that. And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the later days, for the vision is for days yet to come. <clears throat> when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips, or also could say son of man, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. <coughs> How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man that touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But well, now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Hmm. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contend or who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And the first verse should be in that chapter, I think. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And then in chapter 11, he's going to go into what this angel said. So now we're going to get to your question. He said, I, I was going to come tell you an answer right away, but for three weeks, the prince of Persia met me and held me back. And then as he continued, he said, I've got to go because Michael came to rescue me and he started fighting him. But the prince of Greece is coming. Well, right off the bat, you're right. How can a physical kingdom be fighting an angel? It's not a physical kingdom. There's just, it just, I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense. So the reference to prince, a prince could, is also a term. Well, he says, Michael, you're a prince. If he calls Michael a prince, Michael's an archangel. So the prince of Persia is an angel of some sort. It's not a game that we play with the youth group, although it could be. But you know what I mean? The prince of Persia is an angel. Probably if he's fighting Michael, he's not a good angel. He's a bad angel. There's a wicked angel referred to as the prince of Persia, and then later on, the prince of Greece is coming. And he's also going to fight against Michael. Michael's the angel that does battle for God's forces. So this prince of Persia and this prince of Greece are a glimpse that we get into spiritual warfare, angelic warfare. And they are attacking Michael. Now, the question then becomes, why are they called this? Isn't that interesting that a wicked angel would be referred to as Persia, and then another one would be referred to as the, the prince or the angel of Greece. Uh, it seems, if we're at hinting here, that 
these angels are assigned territories, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And this makes us wonder if there's a hierarchy going on among wicked angels. I mean, you'd expect there would be. But could it go down even further? Could there be not only an angel over Persia, but an angel over the Iraq, a city? Or, yeah, what, what is there a prince of America? You know, it would not be surprising at all for Satan to have a wicked angel assigned to this country, you know, to be working with demons or lesser figures who are assigned, yeah. assigned to territories, maybe even to us, you know. Wouldn't be surprising, yeah. I think that when, uh, <coughs> I forgot one book, I think it's, I think First Timothy, something like that, mm -hmm. where it talks about Satan will be loosed. Oh. You think that maybe it, it could do something like with this? Because they have their certain territory, like they're limited, but on that day when they would just be able to go everywhere and like all attack at once, maybe? Yeah, I know vaguely what you're talking about. I can't answer that though. That's a good question. That's a good thought. I thought of. But even back then, they have the ability. But then he, Satan's bound up, but then he'll be loosed again. Hmm. I'd have to study that. I don't know. That's an interesting question. You ought to study that. Yeah? I think it was a Professor Bourne's class, but I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. But he made reference to how angels, um, one of the ways that they were, they would um, disobey God and become fallen away and everything is that they left their post. Mm-hmm. And it refers to it as a post or like an area. Hmm. So it's kind of interesting to mm -hmm. think that. You know, like the structure. Angels, yeah, like these, these angels are assigned to a specific area. And the way they disobey God and stuff like that hmm. is by leaving. And, oh, that is right. interesting because these seem like, these are wicked angels, so. But yet they have a post of some sort, mm -hmm. it seems. So I don't know, but. It makes you wonder, is there an angel that knows you and I, and is, that, is there a system? See, I, I don't know, but when I see, like, um, fortune tellers and people mm -hmm. on TV, a lot of that's just fake, I know. But if ever it wasn't fake, the stuff I see wouldn't worry me too much, because I've often kind of thought, like, the majority of the uh, fortune telling that I see, like, on late night shows and stuff or whatever, back in infomercials, they were telling them past events, not future. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, if there's a network of wicked angels out there and somebody has tapped into Satan's power, wouldn't they be able to see all that information? Wouldn't they be able to look and see, oh yeah, growing up you had this issue that you never told anyone. You did this. You never told anyone. Well, they would know that. You know what I mean? So I was never impressed by that because I thought, well, it could be wickedness at work. Make sense? Yeah. So... And then very little talking about the future, but they could manipulate some of that too. For a long time I thought that though, you know. It's All right. Up. Well, anyway, it's a glimpse into what goes on. Now this message is going to be tough. I don't know what else to say. It's going to be tough, but I think we need to plow through it because it's, it's not tough in a bad way. It's tough because it's so specific and so detailed that it's hard to keep track of the storyline because he's just flying out with the information of what's going on. We have, we're about to transition in chapter 11. We're going to transition to no longer a class in the Old Testament. We are now a class of history, ancient history. And Daniel's going to be our textbook. Daniel's going to be the one that through, technically it's the angel giving Daniel this information, that is going to be the one who shares us the history of the period of time that we know very little, well, I shouldn't say know very little about, but scripturally we would not know much about, and that is the Greeks, the period of silence, all that. Now, I have not checked this, so you need to vet it and make sure, but I was looking, I wanted you guys to have something that would help you keep the information together, and since it was Church of Christ, I thought, well, it's probably going to be good. We'll see. But, Hold on to that. I don't know if it'll be helpful or not. What is very helpful in this area is if you have your um, chambers thing that I printed out for you, a syllabus. Mm. He'll keep track of all the information for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to erase this board, so you may be needing it. 
Wait, can I take a picture of it? Yeah, from do that. Take a picture of it and uh, oh, for me too. While you're there, can you like stand next to it and point to it and smile? Yeah. Maybe you have a little thumbs up. A Facebook. And Instagram. There you go. All right, so. No, race was poor. Mm. And I'm going to attempt to make sense of this last part. <clears throat> but it is a lot. And just know, as I'm telling it to you, I've tried to narrow it down. So there's more information than what I'm getting you. Okay? You're just so nice. But you have it in back. Smith's uh, commentary. So use that. Use that thing. If you're ever looking through this, the nice thing is if you just have a quick question, you can, he spells it out pretty succinctly. But it's just one thing after another. I thought it was Chambers wrote it. No, Chambers has his syllabus. Chambers will help you out. The Smith commentary will help you out oh. too. I mean, the stuff's pretty accepted. Is it? Which Chambers? These it? chapters are the reasons why critics hate Daniel so much because he is spelling out everything. Yeah. And that can't be possible. That makes them supernatural. And we don't believe in the supernatural. So the ways they get around that are interesting. They try to, one of them tries to nitpick and say, well, he doesn't get everything exactly right, but then they, it's a real simple answer. It's like, he wasn't trying to get everything exactly right. He was just giving the overview some details. That's it, you know? The fact that he gets anything even close is going to be amazing, but he's specific. So, uh, and others are just going to retreat and say, well, he had to be written later. There's just no way. Well, then why would he, why would Ezekiel reference it? You know, that doesn't make sense. So, it's just fun stuff. That's smarter than anybody. I think the Ezekiel reference to Daniel is really cool. I do too. That one's neat. All right. We pick up here in verse 2. And I'll go ahead and read for you guys because I want you to be able to take notes. So ask me to slow down if I need to, okay? Well, which way do you take notes on? I'm just saying if, if you need to keep track of the chronology and stuff like that, um, and we'll be going pretty slow anyway, I think. So chapter 11. God, this is kind of the heading here. God's going to give Daniel an exact future prediction, or predictions, up until 165 B.C. So during this time, the, the, the question kind of remains, why is God doing this? Why is God giving Daniel information about what's going to happen and clear up to 165 B.C.? Yeah, why? Well, so glad you asked. Good. <coughs> so. Because the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the 400 years in between, is known as what? Intertestamental. The intertestamental period. Also, sometimes it's called the 400 years of silence. Mm, yeah. yeah. Why? More. Because nothing in the Bible is talking about it. We have to find other sources to figure it out. But God keeps his people through his words, right? They need a word from God to sustain him. So what God Ooh. has actually done is he has gone to Daniel, wow. and in Daniel he said, basically, because there's, no, I'm paraphrasing here in a sloppy way, but Daniel, because there's not going to be any prophet or anyone to give you my words, I'm going to give them all to you right now. From now all the way up to 165. Now, why did he stop at 165? So, we'll do it here. Daniel. Daniel. And that's... Um, Daniel's up to 165. Why did he stop there? Because after 165 B.C., they're going to be okay. 165 B.C., right around that time, is after Antiochus Epiphanes and that big invasion, and there's a lot of turmoil going on. After that, the Jews were at peace, and it leads into the time of Christ. Now, not perfect peace, obviously. There's still you know, issues or whatever. But by and large, they would have enough prophecy to keep going, and it would line us up to where Jesus is coming, right? But up until that point, there's going to be so much turmoil going on that without the Word of God, you know, all would be lost. But because he gave Daniel that ahead of time, the Jews were able to study it and recognize, wow. And we'll see even that they tried to, um, they, 
they even tried to use that at times to go in, you know, oh, I think God's predicting this, so let's help out this nation and kind of make that, you know. Uh, they would do some things like that, too. Also, that's going to be the reason why what Josephus says about them coming out to Alexander the Great, well, you know, we got the predictions, maybe that'll save us, and it did, it saved them. So, huh. I think that's an excellent reason why God told Daniel when he doesn't normally tell anyone else because there's about to be a big period with no prophets of God. What are the actual, like, dates for the 400 years? Like, when does the 400 years of silence begin and then end? Um, I mean, the end years. of Malachi, the beginning of Matthew. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. I, but I, 400 years, I'm pretty sure, is a general sloppy term. So I'm going to just guess it's around, four, just say around 400 to zero. Jesus was born before that. So in reality, it's four something to just before zero. Gotcha. You know, I, I don't know the exact dates. And the, the other issue is people are going to debate it. That's why I don't, you know, people will argue and say, well, 450, 430, 4, you know, they'll they'll pick different numbers. And I don't think it's worth nitpicking. I just, it's interesting, though, that you, I might have just heard you wrong. But, but it's the Greeks and the Romans. It's the time from the Greeks to the Romans, basically. Yeah. Almost the whole Greek empire is, well, no, the whole Greek empire is pretty much skipped over at that time. Hmm. What were you saying? Sorry, I interrupted you. Um, the reason, just a kind of clarification, I guess, the reason why God is telling Daniel this is because um, during this time there's not going to be any prophets. Yeah, to... and every other, not every other time, but the majority of Old Testament history, there was some prophet of the Lord for people to inquire of. Even in the dark days, you could search and you could find him. Majority okay. of the time. But we're about to go into a period of time where there isn't going to be a prophet of God around. There's no revelation from God whatsoever. Hmm. So because of that, that's I think that's a good reason. It may not be right, but it makes sense to me. So that's why I'm sharing it with you guys. That's a good reason for why Daniel gotcha. was given this information. Cool, cool, cool. All right, first two verses. Oh, it's going to talk about a few kings. So, <clears throat> and now I will show you the truth. Behold. Three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Uh, all right, so three more kings of Persia are going to happen. Historically, that's exactly what happened. I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm going to write them up here. The first king, though, I will let you know it is... Cambyses, and I'm probably butchering these names, C-A-M-B-Y-S-E-S. -E Cambyses, second king is going to be Smyrdis, that's a fun name, S-M-E-R-D-I-S. -E and then the third king, you already know, Darius the Great. Oh. Darius the Great. The king after Darius, his name is fun to spell. Clerk. The Xerxes. He is that fourth king that is talking about here. Esther. Esther, exactly. Book of Esther, King Xerxes. Esther yeah, and later right. books of the chronology. Yeah. So, fourth king. Um, he's also known as Ahasuerus. Weird. Yeah, Ahasuerus. And that's, I believe, A-H-A-S-U-E-R-U-S. -E um, so that's another name for him, but Xerxes. Xerxes thought himself to be a god. So, next two verses say about this king. Then a mighty king shall rise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity. Posterity would be like kindred or, you know, his sons or whatever. Not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Now, whose kingdom is this? Well, first of all, it comes after Xerxes. It's big enough that when it's finally split up, it's split up between the four, what does it say, the four winds of the earth? Yeah, yeah. four winds. That would be like the four directions of the compass. It's a huge worldwide kingdom, and it's split up. And it's not split up to his posterity, his sons necessarily. It is given to others and, and in four divisions. Who's that going to be, do you know? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, exactly. 
Alexander the Great. So, <coughs> we'll just do this. Verses 1 through 2, we're talking about Xerxes. Verses 3 through 4, we've got Alexander the Great. And his kingdom gets split up into four other kingdoms. Let me see if I have them written down. We have Alexander the Great and the four um, Greek empires, or I could also say Hellenistic, H-E-L-L, yeah, E-N-I-S-T-I-C, Hellenistic Greek empires. Hellenism is the idea of, of like, Greek culture, stuff like that, Hellenistic, so I want you to be aware of that, Hellenistic yeah, Jews, things like that. <laughs> so that's historically what happened. Okay. Oh, you guys are doing well in your history lesson. Any questions about this so far? I'm going to hate testing. All right. Yeah, you are, but don't you love the fact this is in the Bible? Yeah. Verses 5 through 6. <clears throat> then the king of the south shall be strong. Oh, by the way, it said it was plucked. I want to emphasize that too. Alexander's kingdom was just, it was plucked up from him and not given to his sons. It was split up. Uh, revolt is what brought it down because he conquered the world. There's no other way to do it. And that's what Daniel says was going to happen. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule. And his authority shall be a great authority. After some years, they shall make an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure. But she shall be given up in her attendance, he in her attendance, he who fathered her, he who supported her in those times. Okay, what's going on there? That's verses five and six so <clears throat> we've got the division I'll draw a little map over here we might refer to later Egypt all right you know you understand this is a map right Mediterranean Sea yeah. Egypt yeah. down here so Alexander the Great conquers the world, then it gets split up into the four Hellenistic empires, and he starts talking about the king of the south and the king of the north. So what we have here, the first king of the south, south is going to be Egypt. Egypt is south. Right. So the king of the south is going to be Egypt, um, and he was... <laughs> one of Alexander's generals. He's ruling from 322 to 305 BC. His name was, <clears throat> I'll write it here, Ptolemy. It starts with a P. Whoa. Ptolemy. P T O L E. Why? Ptolemy. And he was who? Ptolemy Soter is the second part of his name. Ptolemy Soter. He is the king of the south, king of the land. It's the region known as Egypt, but the Greeks occupied it. And it was more specifically the Ptolemies, the people of this land. All right, the Ptolemies were one of the, one of the divisions. There are other, what are the four divisions here? We've got the Ptolemies, we got the Seleucids. We, we, we wrote them, it's in that book, we covered them last week. But. So that's where he was. And keep in mind, Daniel's telling us all this before it happened. So, the king of the north, coming to the king of the south, um, who's one of the generals. And by the way, the Septuagint will translate this Egypt. It won't even say south, it'll translate it Egypt. So that's a real good clue that that's what we're talking about in the south. Now, one of his princes, one of his princess, princes is going to be talking about Seleucus. Um, Seleucus fled from Syria to Egypt. Okay. Whew. All right, we're at verses five through six. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to write this down so you guys get it. So, 
south is Egypt. That's, that's complicated or anything. North is going to be in this region up here. You guys can get that right. North. Yeah. Um, and I believe so Syria. Well, Syria is long gone. Yeah, south is know. Egypt, and they are the Ptolemies. North is going to be. I don't know what the. It's the Fertile Crescent. It's. It's going to be the region of Syria, and it is occupied by the Seleucids or the Seleucids. Hmm. L e u c i d s. All right. So when I say south, I'm talking about the Ptolemies. When I say north, I'm talking about the Seleucids. Seleucids. I don't know how to pronounce it. I should look that up. Right. So those are the regions. He's a prince. Uh, Egypt. And it says a prince from the north. That's a thing. Um, well, here, I'll, I'll go into what it says. One of his princes, one of these princes, fled from his own territory up north in Syria, up here, and he fled to Egypt. And he stayed in Egypt for a long time, and what ended up happening there, uh, let's see, he excelled above the Ptolemies until about 281 BC. So we got some, see it's a confusing mess already. So someone from the north, one of the princes moved down here and then he started growing up and growing up and growing up and being greater and people loving him. And the actual people, the Ptolemies, were getting less. Okay. So that's what happened. And then the successor of the Ptolemies in the salute. Okay, so. The successor became bitter rivals. All right, so we've got these lands in constant rivalry. They're fighting each other. One moved down there, then their kids hated their kids, and they're fighting back and forth. Just, that's how it's summarizing. It. Their kids hated their kids. They didn't like each other, and so they fought. But one of the kids. <coughs> and his name was. Oh, let me, let me go through. One of the princes equals that name is going to be Seleucus. Yeah, so Seleucus. Seleucus is the one that fled to Egypt. Uh, I'll just put the south. He fled to the south. All right, we're getting confusing already. He's the one that fled to the south, and then he grew up there. And after this, there was turmoil and fighting back and forth until, enter the scene, uh, Philadelphus. <clears throat> Uh, so 35 years later, after this guy had already died, 35 years later, we have a guy named uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus, and we have another guy named Antiochus II. Those two were the leaders. So Ptolemy Philadelphus down here, Antiochus II up here. And they thought, you know what, we've been fighting forever. Let's try to end the fighting. And so they tried to correct it with... <coughs> A political marriage. So, Philadelphus, his daughter Bernice, married Antiochus' son to seal a peace treaty. That was a common practice then. So those two married each other. And you think, okay, this is going to work out well. We're going to cause peace in that region or whatever. So that was their plan. But two years after that marriage, Antiochus abandoned his Egyptian wife. So Antiochus is the son. He's like, forget you, I don't like you. He kicked her to the curb. He abandoned his Egyptian wife. Like he left her or he just kicked her out? I think he left her. Okay. I think. Uh, he abandoned his wife and he remarried an old wife. He was already married before. He remarried an old wife. Her name was Laodice. Uh, of course. And guess what that old wife did? Later, she killed she him. Killed him. <laughs> Later, <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny. But he left one to go back to the old wife that he had before at that peace treaty marriage. And then um, later, she killed him, and not only him, she killed the other son named Bernice as well as their child. So, where did I write that down? Like 
Bernice, okay, Bernice was the daughter. So she killed him, she killed the ex, and she killed one of the kids that they had. There you go. <laughs> That's the lady that he wanted to go back to. So, so much for a peace treaty. It didn't exactly work out. And guess what Daniel said? They're going to try to make peace, but it's not going to work out. Well, I'd say historically that happened. Hey, you marry, it'll be just fine, and then she kills you. Okay, so that's all that happened in verse 6. Now we can go to verse 7 through 9. Does that make somewhat sense? Yeah. Okay, good. <coughs> I think it's kind of, I shouldn't do that, but it's kind of funny. It is funny. So he shall be given up, the attendant to father, support over her in those times. So that's exactly what Daniel's saying. Now, continue with history. Verse 7. And from a branch in a, yeah, and from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. He shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images, their precious vessels of silver and gold, and for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. So you put that together, we've got... Um, we, we've got the uh, a branch from her roots. Well, who's her? Is that the ex-wife? The daughter of the king of the south shall come to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. She gets killed by the jealous wife. But she shall be given up in her attendants who fathered her and who supported her in those times. And from a branch from her roots. So, one of the other kids... One of the people in her line that got the lady that got killed. <coughs> um, yeah, from that, one of their kids is going to come to the south. He's going to try to deal, he's going to carry off to Egypt their gods with metal images, precious vessels of silver. For some years, refrain from attacking the king of the north. All right, let's go to the history. Maybe that'll help piece this together a little bit. So, to avenge his sister's death. His sister who got killed by the wicked ex, La Laodicea, or what, uh, what was her name? Laodice? Laodicea. Laodice. Yeah, no, it's not that, that's funny. <coughs> well, I don't think it's that. Interesting thought. So to avenge that, Ptolemy the Third, Ugaretus, which is another interesting name, he carried out this military expedition against Seleucus II. And uh, Seleucus II, his name was Callinicus. And Jerome says that he won. He brought back 40,000 talents of silver and 2,500 idols. And then Seleucus Callinicus later returned, or later he attempted to invade Egypt but was thoroughly defeated. Now the one thing that helps us out is we know the Seleucids are in the south. I mean, I'm sorry, Seleucids are in the north, the Ptolemies are in the south, and they tend to put these before their name, so it helps clue us in. So, he was in the north, he was in the south, well, what ends up happening? The northern guy invades the south, takes a ton of stuff, and then brings it all back, according to what Jerome says. And then, uh, no, 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 I'm telling you wrong. Hold that thought. Ptolemy wanted to um, get vengeance for the death of his sister, so he came up here. He's the one that came up here. Sorry, I was telling you all wrong. I don't really know. So after that political marriage and the bad thing happened, he came up here, and he brought back all this, all these talents and idols back to Egypt. The northern guy tried to retaliate, but failed. He tried to invade Egypt to get him back, but he was defeated. Okay? So, what we have here, if we could diagram this, <laughs> we have the Ptolemy and the Salute. Seleucids. We have constant, we have constant battle back and forth. We try to unite with a marriage. 
But then that marriage goes goes south and spirals out of control in the turmoil. Yeah, it goes and then south. we're fighting again. And then because of the death vengeance, this person, the Ptolemies, attack the south. They win. Uh, take back a bunch of spoils. The south comes to attack. I mean, they attack the north. Now, the north comes. The Seleucids come to attack Ptolemy. Lose. Fail. So, but Daniel's calling this stuff out as it happens. All right. Constant fighting, messy marriage, they win, they lose. Got all that? I'm really trying to narrow this down because i got to remember this better next time. i got to, got to, got to. So, verses 10 through 16, back to history. His sons shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north, and he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail, for the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. <coughs> In those times, many shall rise against the king of the south, and, and the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength, no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in glorious land, in the glorious land, with destruction in his hand. Okay, all of that. So, North, who are the people of the north? They're the, um, what are we calling them? So, so, so do you, uh, Seleucids. 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 Yeah. Seleucids. Yeah. Seleucids. People in the south are called? The Ptolemies. The Ptolemies. Ptolemies. That, those sound like good questions, by the way. Just People in the north, Seleucids. People in the south, Ptolemies. The people of the south, the Ptolemies, at this time, they have instead extended their border up to here, they're controlling the region of Palestine, too. Mm -hmm. They're powerful. These guys are not as powerful. Um, but history is going to continue again. Uh, so what we have here, we have Seleucids, and we have someone named Antiochus the Great, and they're the ones that are spoken of here. Uh, I guess Seleucus the Third, Serranus with a C is the one that's being spoken of, and then Antiochus the Great. They're the sons that we're talking about. Now, Antiochus, he had a lot of good military success. He took Phoenicia, and he took some of Palestine, and he established Gaza as his fortress. So he's pushing his way on down here in the land of Palestine. Um, and he raised an army of 70,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 73 elephants. And why is he doing all this? Because he's preparing for a big war against Ptolemy. Oh, here we go again. Another arrow's coming down. Big war against Ptolemy. So he's gathering all this stuff. Um, so he was preparing for war, but when he came down to fight, try it again, all this great stuff still loses. Doesn't win. Um, he was defeated at the Battle of Raphia. Not fun. Raphael, not the Battle of Raphia. He suffered enormous losses. He lost 10,000 infantry, 300 cavalry, five elements, elephants, um, not five elements, and 4,000 prisoners were taken. But 13 years later, he regrouped. He regrouped and he attacked again. And this time, the Jews who were in the land of Palestine, they were revolting as well. Why were they revolting? because they were trying to cause trouble for the Ptolemies. They thought they were fulfilling Daniel's prophecy, so some of them started revolting. 
this guy up here, he's, he's regrouping, it's been 13 years. But what ends up happening after this 13 year period is, plus, plus, plus. Mm. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So he ended up winning he after all. He regrouped and attacked again. Okay, and I don't know, I, 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 apparently it's not important. 13 years later, he's going to come back and he's going to attack again. Now, why is all this happening? Because of the weakness and everything of these battles back and forth, this is what paved the way, this big historical mess for another person to enter the scene. And that person... Harry. Hold on. No, we're getting him. He comes later on. Uh, let's see. Antiochus the Great is going to march into Palestine. And he is going to... Um, okay, so he wins. He's going to... Antiochus the Great from the north is going to come down and he's going to win because the turmoil and the revolt, he's almost unopposed when he marches into the land of Palestine and takes it back. So he conquers it there. It's all set up for him. <coughs> but keep in mind, he didn't win all the way in the south. He just took this area right here. So he extended his border up to the land of Palestine. He, he was almost unopposed because the Jews were doing this big revolt thing. Uh, so he came down, he made it this far. Later on, he wants to get greedy and go even further, and that's what we'll read about next. This is Antiochus? Yes, this is Antiochus of the Seleucids. So, he, he doesn't he fight Ptolemies? Or no? no uh, yeah, yeah. And then the Ptolemy, remember, the, the Ptolemies occupied all of this region. He's way up here. Mm. Well, the Jews started revolting, thinking they were fulfilling prophecy. So, Antiochus of the Seleucids... Uh, comes down and he's able to take this part real easily because the Jews made it a mess and made it easy for him. But he's going to get greedy and he wants to come and take this. So this whole debacle is what paved the way for him to take that a victory. But when I say victory, he didn't he didn't take the entire region. He made it down here. Okay, okay. that's where we are so far. Um, and that's what Daniel has told us. For the king of the south, verse thirteen. I'm sorry for the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first, and after some years he will come with great army and abundant supplies. That's what we just talked about. In those times, many shall rise against the king of the south and violent in order to fulfill the vision. See, this is exactly what Daniel said. I'm reading it again. By mistake, but still. <sighs> Let's see. So people will take this to mean, like, the Twin Towers and the Barack Obama. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know. I'm asking. I wouldn't be surprised. But yet it's, it's silly for them, too, because it fits so perfectly with what, it, what is happening. Yeah. It just makes good sense. Uh, all right. He shall set... This is verse 17. Um, this is probably talking about Antiochus here, I believe. He shall set his face to come with strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom but shall not stand uh, or be to his advantage. Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an, ex uh, an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. All right, trace that. Weird. 17 through 20. Antiochus later tried to gain political control of Egypt because that's what his, his sights were set on. Um, but, <clears throat> uh, and he did that by marrying his daughter to their son. But sadly, what happened there is his own daughter decided to side with their son instead of dad. So he's hoping to like, hey honey, go marry him and we'll get political control and we'll take it over. But his own daughter betrayed him and she ended up really loving her husband. What a shock, that's a crazy idea. 
and she sided with the South, oh, with the Ptolemies instead. Good. So he wasn't able to, to, uh, to accomplish his plan, but that's what Daniel is talking about there. Um, then he engaged in a few more military battles, exploits and stuff, but the Romans, the new nation of the Romans, defeated him and forced him to pay heavy, heavy tribute. And eventually he died because he was in a raid and he was trying to get money to help pay for his tribute, and so he was killed in that raid. So his son um, also, <laughs> oh, that's, this is funny too, his own son tries to come into the scene and take some of the temple treasures, mm -hmm. steal them, mm -hmm. and use them to pay tribute and stuff like, well, take them anyway. <sighs> but his son died mysteriously. No one really knows. God. They think he was probably poisoned or something. Mm -hmm. So his own son didn't live, so we got this big mess again. So... Verses 21 through 24 is going to take us to Antiochus the fourth epiphany. So we just went from, what, second to third to now we're going to get to the fourth. And I believe he's going to be the bigger deal. So that is verses 21 through 24. Here we go. In his place shall arise a contemptible person. We're talking about Antiochus the fourth now. A contemptible person whom royal majesty has not been given. Hold that thought. He shall come without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from that time an alliance is made with him. He shall act deceitfully. He shall become strong with a small people. Without warning he shall come into the richest parts of the province and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done. Scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods, he shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. So, down to verses 21 through 24, which I kind of, you know, skip that mess. 21 through 24, we're back to Antiochus Epiphanes. Ooh, Antiochus fourth. Epiphanes, the fourth. Oh. Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, and he is the big deal guy that we're talking about, I believe, with Judas Maccabees. <sighs> yeah. But we'll come back to that. I got to check that and make sure I'm telling you right. So, um, and this is in 175, 175 through 163 BC. That's the chronology that we're at now. We went through a big mess to get there, big force. And what he does. He, it says he was not, a, he, he wasn't supposed to be king, though. That's what Daniel said. Well, that's true. He wasn't actually king. He was the brother of the king. He was the brother of the guy who was supposed to be the king. And so the way he became king was just manipulation. He manipulated himself to the throne. And he would become friends with a bunch of people and steal their wealth later on. He was a real, real slick, smart Hard. guy. Yeah, a con. So let's look about what let's look at what he did. Even those who oh wait, twenty five, and he shall stir up his powers and in his heart against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. For plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him, his army shall be swept away, many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he, and he shall work his will and return to his own land at the appointed time, he shall return and come to the south, but it shall not be at this time, be this time as it was before, for ships of Katim shall come against him, <coughs> and he shall be afraid and withdraw. He shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and he shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. And he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. 
but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. The wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, but they and many shall join themselves to them with flattery, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. Ooh. All right, a lot that we're talking about. But who, who are we talking about here again? Remind me. Antiochus. Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. <laughs> Epiphanes. He's the big one that um, the books of Maccabees talk about. Okay. okay, so he partially invaded Egypt. So Antiochus partially invades Egypt, and he crowns himself their king. All right, so Antiochus the Seleucid, Seleucids. He, he's won to this point. Later on, he's regrouped a bit. Now he's come down, and he's partially, I'll just put it here, he's partially invaded Egypt. A little bit there. And he's done enough to cause turmoil. What, what I mean by that is the real king ran away, but he caught the real king in the process of running away. But he didn't kill him. He held on to him. Because the king's brother, the Ptolemy king's brother, he took the throne in Alexandria, Egypt. So we got king, king's brother, king runs away, is captured by the Seleucids, Antiochus Epiphanes, king's brother, stays here, sets up shop, so the kingdom is still standing. And so what happens? After that, Antiochus releases the king and pretends to give him support in order to stir up uh, an Egyptian unrest. So rather than take it, he says, oh, I'm going to give him their king back, and I'm going to support him, and now they've got civil war going on there. So now they're fighting each other because... King's brother wants to stay king, and the old king comes back, and then there's that. So he's a real slick, yeah. con, kind of tricky guy there, I guess. So that's what he does, civil unrest. So after that happened, Antiochus um, sweeps through Palestine, conquering it again, making sure they have it back. Uh, where did I lose my place at? When he did that, he stripped the temple of all the gold, and as a matter of fact, he even like took the gold plating off the temple and everything. I mean, he really stripped that thing bare, which would have been really sad to the Jews. But um, when he returned to Egypt in AD 168, so in the middle of his reign, when he returned to Egypt, now that they had civil unrest going on for a while, he's like, I'm going to finish the job. I'm going to take this place over. It's been stewing long enough. But he was intercepted by these ships of Katim. Now, these ships of Katim are probably referring to these Roman uh, soldiers, these Roman people that stepped in. Let's see. They met him along the way, and they warned him, do not take Egypt. If you take Egypt, you will be waging war with this new nation of Rome. Now, remember, Antiochus, his, it wouldn't have been his dad, it would have been his granddad, I think. He tried to fight Rome and was, he lost miserably. So Antiochus knows this, and so he, he is frustrated, but he decides, I can't take Egypt. I just can't have it. There's just no way. So he leaves because he, he doesn't want to get in war with Rome. But he's mad when he leaves. So where does he go when he's mad? Right back to the Jews in Palestine. And he takes out his fury on them. That's what it is. The Jews are still there. And he has not only stripped them of their gold, now he's going to come back. And that's where you read about some of the bad things that happen at the hands of Antiochus Epiphanes. This is referred to as, this right here, is referred to as the abomination that causes desolation. The abomination of desolation. And remember when he offered a pig on the altar, desecrating it, uh, that's what he did. He was he was inside. He set up an idol in the temple. Um, he did a number of things like that. Now Jesus talks about this. He says to his people, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel, run away, get out of there. This is in Matthew chapter 24. Well, what Jesus, I believe, is talking about, he's not saying that Daniel is talking about something that happens way off in the future. This happened with the Greeks. But Jesus is saying, you're going to see it again, because somebody else is going to come and take over the temple, and that is the Roman Emperor Titus. The Roman Emperor Titus 
in around 8070 is going to come in. And he's going to do the exact same thing that Antiochus Epiphanes did. He's going to desecrate the temple. He's going to come in there and take it. And Jesus warns his people, when you see that, you get out of there and run. So that's the connection. But this is referred to as the abomination that causes desolation. And Jesus used that to get them to think about it. Anytime the temple is defiled, that's what it, the abomination is. It that's 87, you said? 80, 70. 80, 70? Yeah. Okay. 70 years into the 80s. <clears throat> so, um, but this one, where we're at now, Antiochus Epiphanes had stopped sacrifices and everything um, because he was frustrated with the Jews. However, rebel Jews came together, and you've got Judas Maccabees, the hammer, steps in. Um, Judas Maccabees led a revolt and took it over. This is what Daniel talks about. All of that leads to the cross, leads to the Messiah. So, oh my God. Judas Maccabees. He takes it back for a while, and then this gets us to the period of the cross. See that? So after Judas Maccabees and the revolt, the vision basically can stop here because Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come out of that crazy background. Crazy, crazy background. So... Um, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 is a great verse. It says in the fullness of time God sent his son born of a woman you know that, that whole verse. God had his plan coming up to the cross and you'd think Daniel stops here but he doesn't. I know you're thinking like oh man can't we just be done. I know you're thinking that but I'll cover this last part last few verses what are like 10 more verses or whatever because he goes into yet more detail in this prophecy. I, it stuns me. And verse 35, And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified. I already read that. Now it's 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all, and he shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god, those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. So we've got a guy who is also greedy, powerful, and is in league with another nation helping him out to be a dominant king or a dominant leader. Who was a king that was really made there by another nation. He was allowed to be king by another nation after 165 BC, leading up to the time of Christ, you know. Herod. Herod. That's what you said, you're, you're right. Most likely we're talking about Herod. Herod, that king who tried to kill all, well, tried, he did kill all the babies in Bethlehem. I mean, that's a lot of power to be able to do stuff like that. And um, verses 40 through 45, We'll finish this up. See, a lot of people are going to attribute this to the Antichrist, to uh, some Antichrist or something like that. But it could just be talking about Herod. Yeah, Herod I think Herod fits this. Um, it says that the, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. Then he shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. He shall pitch 
his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. <clears throat> Yet he shall, he shall come to his end and none to help him. Uh, now, if we're talking about uh, Herod in the verses before, most likely this person is going to be Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus would fit this bill. Probably not the Antichrist, like some were saying, you know, because a lot of people want to say this sounds like an Antichrist. But Caesar Augustus could fit this bill too, because he is a um, powerful individual. Uh, he controlled people. Uh, Herod killed killed two of Herod's own sons. Um, yeah. Anyway, so during this time, we've got Caesar Augustus and we got his figurehead, Herod, over there. Herod was a ruthless guy in himself, though, because he did have two of his own sons killed because he was concerned about them revolting. Or, and not only that, he uh, died a terrible death, according to Josephus. He rotted away. And because people hated him so much, he ordered that all the Jewish leaders be executed the day he dies because he wanted people to cry at his funeral. Hmm. Luckily, as far as I know, they didn't follow through with that. But, I mean, he was a ruthless person, and then Caesar Augustus would be the main guy. So you put that combination together, and you've got, a, I think you've got a pretty good way of finishing this out. And then you've got chapter 12. <clears throat> chapter 12. All right. You guys want to start reading again? You're getting tired, so I want you to wake up. This is a real short chapter. Go ahead, Gabe. First verse. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, <laughs> such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. All right, well, when Jesus quotes this, <clears throat> he refers it to AD 70. And after the days of Caesar Augustus, makes sense, probably talking about 70 AD when the destruction is going to happen again. Gotcha. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now let's pause there for a second. Um, now we probably, since the warning of AD 70 is coming, I think we're talking messianic. We're looking at Jesus' kingdom. Uh, probably his messianic kingdom. Uh, but... During that whole time, remember, the gospel's getting out, good things are happening, but there's this great period of suffering that comes at AD 70. And that's what verses 5 through 7 are talking about, most likely. Uh, so keep reading. Then I, Daniel, look, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream, and one on the bank of the stream, and on that bank of the stream. <clears throat> and someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, and he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end all these things would be finished now what is times times and a half a time a lot of times it's just yeah it's just an indefinite period of time is what it is just for a season for a time it's almost always referring to something negative or bad in scripture so this is probably talking about that siege of jerusalem with titus and the roman emperor in AD 70. all right verse 8 I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, 
And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. <clears throat> Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the uh, 1,335 days. Yep. But, oh, uh, uh, finish the sentence. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place the end of, at the end of the days. All right, 1,290 days, and we have 1,335 days. Okay, what is that about? Well, <clears throat> last bit of notes we got to get up here on this board. Literature and form. According to Josephus, uh, the Roman armies, when they approached Jerusalem, it was the 27th day of the month, so October in AD 66. But, um, and they came with their abominations, their military standards, whatever you want to call them. And under the pressure of the siege, that daily sacrifice was suspended in AD 70 on July 14th. And the following month, Titus, the Roman general, forced his way into Jerusalem and utterly destroyed it. And the city was finally put to the torch on August 6th, which is in eight, August 6th of AD 70. Mm -hmm. So... What I'm saying is if you put all that together, you arrive at three years, eight months. Three years and eight months is equal to 1,335 days. You see, that's, that's what he's talking about. From when the siege is starting to when uh, they're taking over the city in the process of that three-year, eight-month period, so you know, it's almost a four-year period, 1,335 days. So, um, the, the 1,290 days that he talks about first, because remember he gave two numbers, 1,290 and then 1,335, that is probably the period that was the worst of the suffering. Hmm. So, AD 70, Jesus predicts this in Matthew 24, is an intense time that was really almost a four-year period of suffering. The worst of which, Daniel says, are 1,290 days, but the complete thing, 1,335 days, historically true. Huh. Make sense? That is a lot of history. So then he's talking about after the hundred and... I'm not convinced that his chronology, that he's trying to be chronologically precise but you have to pay attention to the before and after. That's what kind of clues you in. Yeah. So I do think he, he brings it up to the Messianic age. And he also talks about um, the, the events of AD 70 and the big abomination of desolation. So Daniel not only spoke about the first one, he also speaks about the second one um, in AD 70. That's a lot of prophecy for this 112 chapter book. Yeah. So you guys will have to check out this paper and see. It may really save you quite a bit. It may really help you out. Because look at the look at the mess of like the marriages and the kings and stuff that goes on. So, but hold on to it though, because this mess, every single one of these is a checkable point to prove that scripture is true. So that's why it's sad that some of the most boring parts in scripture are actually some of the most some of the greatest as far as accuracy and checkability and stuff. Right, so. Parker, you want to pray for us? Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Father, I uh, thank you for all of this information, even though it is a lot to absorb. I pray that uh, as we study this and dig into it a little bit more, that it can uh, become more clear in our heads. Um, I thank you for Seth and his willingness to prepare and teach us. Uh, I pray for safety as we go throughout the rest of this day. I thank you for uh, another day and another opportunity. It's in your name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, now I'll shut off the camera for the next part of this. Oh, please do. Please yeah, do. This is the part where you need to That's why a lot of confusion today. Never. He's just trying to turn.